Go for it, Paul. Introduce yourself. Loud. Hey, everybody. My name's Matt. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Scott Lee. I'm an alcoholic. And we are so thrilled to be here. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Clubhouse. Thank you for everyone who made this possible. Um, we'd like to open with a quotation from Lois Wilson. Was asked one time what she did in the moment of silence, and she said, I invite God to the meeting. It's not that I don't believe God's here. I do believe that. Something special happens for me when I stop and honor that presence. So in a few moments, I'm going to ask you to have a few moments and each invite God to the meeting. There may be somebody here who doesn't have a God, or you got here like I did, afraid there might be one. Mm -hmm. If that's your situation, let me recommend you borrow my God. I recommend him very highly. He's got a great sense of humor. And you can address him as a God of Scott's limited understanding. Get you off on the right foot. And, uh, and then we're going to do something a little bit unusual. We're going to slowly, I say again slowly, I don't know if there are any Yankees here. I love the Yankees, but I can't pray as fast as they did. We're going to slowly whisper the serenity prayer. Let's take a few moments and invite God to the meeting. Serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. For me, that changes it from a ritual back into a prayer. Um, so we're here to talk about this blue book, and uh, just in the interest of Matt having any chance at all to speak, I'm going to let him go first. For those of you who know me know how funny <laughs> that is. Go for it. <laughs> hey, thanks, Scott. Hey, everybody. My name is Matt. I'm an alcoholic. Amen. Oh, thanks. so thankful to be here and grateful for the opportunity to be in the big book this morning and all day today with you uh, lovely people. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, thanks for being here. Uh, this is... This is where the miracle has happened for me, is uh, as it talks about in, in the foreword, uh, where one alcoholic you know, sits with another alcoholic, sharing their experience, strength, and hope. And what I hope to do today, what we hope to do today, is to share our experience, strength, and hope with, with this book and whatever else you know, is supposed to come out of, of the channel. Um, you know, by the time I was 23 years old, I had, had burned just about every bridge that I'd been given and uh, had wrecked cars, relationships, and woken up in places that I don't remember going to sleep, in towns that I don't remember visiting, and next to people I'd never met before. And started waking up in places I couldn't get out of, like treatment centers, like hospitals, jails, and, and uh, all of this just, just for, for another drink, uh, for my solution, which was, was alcohol. And I, um, being, being the intelligent alcoholic that I was, I would, you know, through the course of time up to then, try to, to control environments, control the uh, what I was taking, you know, what what type of drink, um, and other things, so that I could continue to enjoy this this lifestyle, and continue to to experience the freedom that I, I, I had flowing through me at, when I first took my first drink at age twelve. Um, yet the the cost continued to get higher and higher, and um, I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't keep up. You know, that equation was not, was not adding up. You know, the pain, the pain of continuing on uh, became unsurmountable, and, and I wasn't able to, to continue. Um, but mainly, it, it helped that I was in um, state custody at the time. They, uh, per, something that happens to me when I start drinking, you know, I, I'm going to get into this, you know, the, what I know now is to be, to be a, a physical allergy something that separates me from, from a normal drinker is like once I start, once I take that drink, something changes physically and I don't, I don't have the power to stop. What ended up happening, you know, towards in later years of my drinking career is I'd end up, like I said, in places I couldn't get out of. Uh, the back of a cop car was a common one. Um, 
I just, I just went hard. You know, half measures availed us nothing, as, as the book says, and, and I found the same to be true with, with, my, um, with my lifestyle. So I would, uh, I would try, like, you know, various ways to, to control and enjoy my drinking, just like it talks about and, and more about alcoholism. Um, changing from place to place, you know, I, I moved from, I, was, I grew up in North Carolina, and I moved to, uh, from the middle of the state to the mountains. Uh, that was a judge, judge's order, but you know I thought it made sense at the time to, to get the law off my back and start new in a new place. But I found exactly what I was looking for in this new in this new city and just better better quality. Um, instead of Jack Daniels, now I'm drinking moonshine, and this was not only cheaper, but it was more you know it was more efficient in getting the job done, and and I could uh, could continue on. Um, I tried. I tried, uh, you know, not going to school um, after I got loaded. I would just stop going to high school altogether because it was getting in the way of my drinking. I, I, I blew, blew a, uh, pretty much blew off a uh, full ride scholarship to college to play sports. All of these things, you know, I had, there were plenty of opportunities to, to, to go on the path. But once I found this solution in, in alcohol, I... I had lost the ability in choice. See, I thought, again, too, when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, that step one, that we are powerless over alcohol, that our lives become a manual, says that, Matt, you can never drink alcohol again. And not only was that some very depressing news, it was only half the truth. Um, Not only can't I drink, but it also says here on the bottom of page 42 that um, I don't have the power not to, not to drink, which is really important because for me, like, I had stopped drinking s- countless times. Mm. Stopping drinking wasn't the problem. They did well putting me in, in, a, in a place where I couldn't get out of, you know, uh, removed me from alcohol for extended periods of time. It was out of my, myself. It, it was out of me physically. But then there would become this this mental obsession, which is the other part of this disease, that would come up with a new plan, and I would find myself drunk. You know, even even though I had plenty of reasons, like I had said, not to, I didn't have the power not you know not to start. And and one of the things that really jumped out at me when I got into this book was on page 24. It says the fact is that for most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. There it is, the first drink. And if I, didn't ha- if I didn't take the first drink, then I wouldn't have to worry about where the second one was coming. And that was always my thought once I took the first, is the second and the third. And, and if I could have stayed in the second or the third feeling, I would be great. But again, that, that allergy kicks in once I get to three, and, and I'm, I'm off to the races. So it was, it was really, I mean... Like I said, I had come into Alcoholics Anonymous several times before. My first time was at 17, and I'll just tell you just a, my quick experience. Uh, I, this was after wrecking a car, judge's orders to go to the A&A, and so I went and I go into a church basement. This is in Raleigh, North Carolina. Open the door, and, and a plume of smoke comes out of the thing. I thought it was on fire for a second. <laughs> So, but I, I cautiously like keep walking in because I like to walk into burning buildings. I'm used to it at this point in my life, and and go in and and uh, there's people in there. Sure enough, and I continue to walk in and they're they're laughing and carrying on, having a good time like we do in meetings. And uh, I, I see them a little bit closer, and, and I realize that that these people are old. I mean, old like tales from the crypt, like coming out like old. And, but they were super nice, just like grandparents, and, and uh, I said, you know, welcome, welcome, we're so glad you're here, and I'm like, yeah, I'm sure glad you're here too, and 
this was like, you know, this, my, this was my perception of Alcoholics Anonymous. Was this is like where a bunch of, you know, elderly people come who can't drink successfully. And in me, I'm 17 years old. I just had a little bit of an issue with the law that I'm having to check my boxes. A misunderstanding. And, yeah, exactly. It, yeah. Precisely. Yeah. So I get to... Uh, I get to the end of this meeting, somehow I endured it and uh, probably uh, picked up smoking if I hadn't already by the end of it and, and <laughs> I had, uh, had, uh, had remembered them saying, you know, keep coming back, as, as we like to say to the new guy. And, and I said, yeah, you betcha. I'll see you in about 50 years, you know, because it hadn't gotten bad. The pain hadn't, hadn't gotten to a level where I had to consider the fact that maybe, just maybe, I wasn't able to control and enjoy my drinking. See, I was, I was at this time, I was. I was somewhat being able to control and enjoy, but ultimately I crossed over that line that, uh, that it talks about here where I've lost the ability to control. I don't have the, the willpower to not start again. And now I'm just, I'm just drinking to live. Um, you people in, in Alcoholics Anonymous are very persistent and you would show up at those meetings that I was in, like that I went to when I was locked up in these facilities, same nice elderly people coming, you know, a AA meeting, and, and I would go and I would listen, and, and uh, again, be lo I would be looking for the differences, and, and I would be looking for those, those things that would separate me from you, and, and it wasn't until, like I said, at 23, um, where I'd burned out, up all of my resources, all of my, all of my finite resources were expensed, I'd burned all of my bridges. I had nobody to, to ask, to, to call on. Um, I'm in the back of the car again, and I cry out to a God that I'm pretty sure wasn't, um, you know, answering my call and really didn't, didn't care. At least, like, I wasn't on his A-team anymore. You know, I'd fallen from grace probably by the age of eight when I, you know, <laughs> so... So I just, you know, I, but I cried out because that was my default. For, and I cried out. I don't know if it was out loud or, or if it was just inside, but it, I said, God, I can't live like this anymore. Please help me. And, and something happened at that very moment that I can't, I can't properly describe, but I, I, I saw the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I saw, because I'd been around you guys long enough, and I knew that there was something happening there. And to the best of my understanding, there was an answer to a prayer. And, and so, you know, I, I would love to tell you that at the, at the end of that prayer that they let me out of the car and I got to go back to my home group and, you know, make coffee and, and that stuff. But that wasn't the case. You know, I had to, had to go. And as we talk about, you know, later in the steps, you know, I had to, I had to set right the wrongs that, that ha had been done. Um, one commonality I've found in all of us coming here is things were not going well. <laughs> However that looks. I um, failed to meet, and, and I, I celebrate 16 years in a few weeks, so I'm, I'm not saying that I've seen it all. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of people come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and nobody has just won the lottery or has, you know, everybody's <laughs> support on... Uh, I, at least for me, it was, you know, it was, uh, I was on a sinking ship. And it required a surrender, not only of a, a physical type in the back of a car, physically surrendering, uh, but also of a spiritual sense. And at that moment, I found the, little, uh, the slightest bit of hope in this calloused heart, in this, this, this being that was just despicable. And everything I had done, and like, you know, from, I think the, the worst thing I'd done was I'd taken from the people who would give me anything, you know, and, and after I did that, I was like, you know what, screw everybody else. If I'm going to hurt the people who, you know, would do anything for me, then, you know, everybody else was fair game. And, and, um, but it reminds me of, you know, growing up in North Carolina, when we went to the beach, we would, um, there would be this thing called the undertow or, or a, current, a rip current. And, uh, what it does is basically you, swim, you if you're out there and it'll it'll suck you out and take you underwater, and if you're not prepared for it, if if you're not you know if you don't know what's going on, you'll panic, you'll start to try and fight it, and you'll drown. People drown every year. Well, the same thing was happening with me and alcoholism, and I'm out there and the rip current alcoholism has me underwater 
and I'm fighting it. And as much as I'm fighting it by myself and trying to fight, I'm, I'm drowning and I'm dying. I'm losing air. One of the things they tell you if you're ever in a rip current or under, <coughs> under, under, under undertow is to not fight, to stop fighting, to surrender. Let it take you where it's going to take you and then swim parallel to, to coast, to the coastline. Well, the same thing had to happen for me with this disease in order for me to be able to receive what you guys were, what you guys were putting down at my feet. I had to stop fighting. And, and that looked to me like a, not only a physical surrender, but a spiritual surrender. And, and, and that was followed by an opportunity I had, and it was probably one of the hardest things I, ha I had to do, and still is something that I challenge, um, I'm challenged with, although it's become incredibly easier, is to, to ask another man for help. So I don't know. I don't know how to stay so, I don't know how to t not take the first drink, because every time I come in, I was very intelligent, like I said. I knew the book, I knew the steps, but I hadn't had the experience yet. And so, like it, like it says in here, willpower is not going to get me there. Self-knowledge is good, but it didn't get me far enough. So what then? What, what's going to have to happen? Well, I'm going to have to surrender those things. I'm going to have to put those down and, and try something else. It says here on page 25, there is a solution. Well, that's really important because at this point, you know, I've, I've identified a, a, a problem. I don't, I don't know how to live between drinks. I, got, I don't know about you, but when I stopped drinking, things got, things got pretty crazy. And, and so I needed, to, I needed to figure out a way to live with, between, between drinks. Um, and it's found, you know... It, in, in, the, in the pages of this book. It says, almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of our shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation, the process <clears throat> of a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. But we saw, here's the thing, we saw that it really worked in others, and we, be, we had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. That's the ticket for me. Because... I didn't like any of this stuff, but I really, really didn't like, I preferred the, the, this to the way that I'd been living it. I'd, be, I'd come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as I'd been living it. So it was only at that point that I was willing to, to reconsider my plan and let's look at what's been working for other people. And so then, you know, when therefore we were approached by those whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the set, a simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We had found much of heaven, and we had been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence, which we had not even dreamed. And that's, that's been my, my experience as well. The, the things in early sobriety, it, take, it took time. I mean, I'm sitting, I'm sitting inside a federal detention facility facing 929 months. That's my story. It, it's, it wasn't looking good for the home team. I stopped drinking. I wanted an award. I wanted bail. But what I got was spiritual tools laid at my feet. I don't know how to cash these in, but you know, I did, I did have a, a strange feeling that things were going to be okay either way. And, and so this, this is the course I took. You know, I, like I said, I reached out for help. I found, I found another man to take me through the big book. Because, again, I thought I was pretty intelligent, but... I've tried reading. I hadn't even read, I don't even know if I've read like a full book from front to back by this time, you know, except for like being forced to. I wasn't just, I'd rather be outside playing and doing things than reading. It just wasn't my thing. But um, I really needed a, a sponsor to sit with me. Not that I couldn't read, but I just, like I'd get, you know, distracted, find something else to do. 
a sponsor to sit down with me and to, to walk me through <coughs> this book. And, and it's not by a chance that the first third of this book is discussing the first step. We talk about the physical allergy in the doctor's opinion. We're starting to talk about this mental obsession that I have that tells me that, you know, this time is going to be different or that, you know what, screw it. Um, so I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm learning about this stuff and I'm going through it and having this experience. Um, and I had come, come th up, grew up, grew up with going to church and going into, you know, the organized religion route. And, and I didn't doubt for whatever, any reason without a doubt that it worked for them. Um, but I wasn't having that same connection. I was afraid of God because the things that I liked to do were against what he wanted me to do. So I just kind of kept my space until I got in, in a lot of trouble, and then I'd reach out and ask for help. But I had a lot of old ideas, and one of the things that my sponsor did, was, which was so beautiful, was when we got to step two, after being convinced... Um, He said, Matt, why don't, why don't we just put what you think about God on the back burner? I'm not going to say that it's wrong or, or right. Let's just take your idea of God and let's put it on the back burner and let's go through this process that's as outlined in the book and try to have a new experience. What a beautiful thing. Couldn't have, couldn't have landed on more fertile soil than, than what I had at that point in time because those old ideas of God were killing me. If I, if, if I, it's pretty important here. You don't have to understand, you don't have to have a clear definition or understanding of, of this power. That's, that's actually, it talks about that being, being impossible for our finite minds to, to fully comprehend an infinite God. But it's like, like Ebby said to Bill here in Bill's story, which I think is another piece of divine happenstance, if you will. Um, why don't you come up with your own conception of God? Because Bill was, was totally against this idea of, of a deity, like of, a, of a, a Christian God, which Ebby was bringing from the Oxford group. And I guess what, what Bill had associated with God up to this point in time. So when, when Bill was objecting, when Ebby shows up, I've got religion, Bill's probably putting up his, his, uh, his walls immediately and saying, no, you know, like, this guy's a quack, you know, I know, you know, and... Um, I'm not so comfortable with this this idea. And then, what I think is why well, I think this is so so divinely inspired is because Ebby's coming from the Oxford Group, which was a Christian-based organization, and nowhere in their literature does it speak of God as you understand Him. They have a clearly defined God. In mm -hmm. my interpretation of this event is that. Something came through Ebby that Ebby didn't know prior to it coming out off of his tongue. And, and I know that Scott loves to talk about these things too. And um, that thing might have saved Bill and have created Alcoholics Anonymous. Because my old ideas are what are going to kill me. Like my sponsor said, Matt, it's not, not what you don't know that's going to keep you in the dark. It's what you're convinced of. And I so desperately needed that. And I continue to need encouragement to, to, to identify these old ideas as they come. And now I, I, I do get a little excited when I'm wrong because it means there's an opportunity for growth. And especially about God. I hit a wall in six years of sobriety where I did not want to drink, but I was seconds and inches away from checking myself into a mental hospital for my own safety. I had to break the box that I had God in. At six years of sobriety, I put God in a box. And my God does not need, he does not live, God does not live in a box. It needs to be bigger than the box. And... And so that was my experience going through step two. And, and um, getting to that point, we, we were asked, and this is, there's so much yeah. in, in there, but, but I think the 
two really, really important questions that helped me and I, I ask the guys that I sponsor or anyone else um, who, who questions, you know, because, you know, we come in with a lot of things going on. I mean, there's no way that you, you know, just like a, just a hurricane of, of thing, you know, displacements inside. I, I can't point the finger at whether I'm an alcoholic, a, an addict, a, a whatever. I, I qualify for multiple 12-step fellowships, so there's no way. And, and it, it asks us at the top of page 44 two really, really um, poignant questions. Third sentence. If, when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably an alcoholic. When you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely. Mental obsession. Or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, physical allergy. You may be an alcoholic. And one of the things that uh, my sponsor has pointed out is that it's, it's an A or B, either one of those. I don't have to, at, at face value, have to say, oh yeah, both of those in order to move on. It's, it's an or, either or. In that case, it, it continues, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. That's, that's pretty, pretty powerful information for me. Um, but don't be doomed or, or you know, it, out of, out of uh, hope if, if you don't have that conception of God nailed down at this time. It doesn't matter. Like my sponsor told me originally, put your ideas, whatever they are, aside. Let's continue on through this process. And I found that that was enough to me to keep the momentum going. It talks about lack of power being my dilemma, our dilemma, and that I had to find a power which I could live. That's still my, my dilemma to this day. When I find myself buttoned up against something, somebody, some event, it's my lack of power. And as soon as I tap into the power, to the source, I find that, oh, wait, you know what? I might not like the situation, person, event, thing. Doesn't require me to like it. But possibly it's just the way that it's supposed to be. And maybe, you know, God will give me the eyes to see. I, I, was, I was upset the other, last, a couple weeks ago, my mother-in-law was in town and she was helping us do some weeding around the house. But she didn't shake the, the, the clods of weeds after, you know, she pulled it out of the ground. So I got an 80-pound bag of, you know, dirt clods. And I'm trying to take it to the, the curb. It breaks. And, you know, I'm sitting there and, and I'm just, I'm really upset about this situation. And I want to get mad at her for trying to help. And um, I, it's just a custom for, I, I give my mom a call on the way and she's a, she's a just a, an awesome person, and my mom was like, I try to, I, sometimes I, I think about the way that God must look at us as children, and, and uh, I try to try to view people the same way, and just how, how often I fail at trying to do his work, and I was like, dang, you know, why'd I call you? I mean, this is, this is not the response I wanted, but isn't that true? <laughs> like, what a beautiful resource we have, you know, that, that I've been given, that I've been able to find through coming up with my own conception of God. Page 46. Even though it is impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend the power which is God. I can't get lost in, in the, the, the knowing. See, I've, I've been paralyzed by, by having to figure it out. And, and let's not let that prevent me from starting a relationship. There's no way that, that I could meet Scott day one and know everything about him. Or that we would have the relationship that we do today um, without continued talk, without, without a uh, nourishing it. 
And there's, there's nothing different than my rela- you know, relationship with, with God. I need to be able to spend time with it, to nourish it. I don't need to fully comprehend or understand Scott before I start talking to him. I just need to st- establish a relationship, you know? Scott, good-looking guy, was recommended by another member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's all I need to know. I didn't need, need to be good-looking, but it's just an added bonus. It's easier to look at. <laughs> um, so, so we just start there. We come up with some, po- you know, some, some positive characteristics of this power, and we, we start the prayer. We start doing those things that are suggested in, in, in our book, and we establish the relationship. At the, end of, at the end of step two, it, there's a question, you know, do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? If I can answer yes to either of those, then, then it's time to continue forward. Let's keep going. Don't worry about having it figured out, nailed down. Trust me, like I said, we're going to need to break the box that you put God in anyway, so let's just keep going. And then... <clears throat> Moving along here, uh, I start to realize, you know, through the process that I've had lots of prejudice on on um, on God and on on situations. And um, one of the things was my dad was, you know, that, that I needed to be I needed to be in a holy place to find God. I needed to be in a meeting to find God. I needed to to uh, be in a church or you know something like that the top of a mountain. My dad was ill, terminally ill, and, and um, I had a commitment. It was a Wednesday night to, a, um, to chair a meeting. My dad was, was at home. He wasn't doing well. He was having trouble breathing, and, and so we had to call the ambulance to take him to the hospital. And I was just so distraught and upset that I was going to have to cancel my commitment to a Wednesday meeting. Because my dad, how dare he not be able to breathe and have to call the ambulance? Maybe a little bit of selfishness and self-centeredness here. I don't know. But um, I, was, I was upset, and I called my sponsor at the time, and I said, you wouldn't believe what happened. Dad's dying. And uh, I hadn't, but of course, it was, I wouldn't be able to chair my home group or chair this meeting. And he's like, Matt, you you." don't have to go to the top of the mountain to find God. I think God is, is right now. May you find him. Now. And later that night, I got to go to the hospital. Um, my mom had went originally, and we switched. And um, I saw my dad on, on, um, in the ICU, and he was flopping around, having trouble breathing. His O2 levels were down, and, and uh, um, I got pulled into a, a, a little office with the doctor, and they said, um, we need to know what you want to do. We can either um, tube him, keep him alive on a machine, or we can get him comfortable. And I didn't, I didn't know the answer to that question. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I couldn't call my sponsor. I didn't have a home group to go to. But God came through me, and he, and, and what the words that came out of my, my mouth were, if it was your dad, what would you do? May you find him now. And the last analysis is only there that he may be found. So I, it says we have to sweep away the prejudice, and that enables us to, to think honestly and encourages you to search dil- diligently within yourself. Then, then, if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. Mm. With this attitude, you cannot fail. And the consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. It takes time for me to learn some of these things, and it continue to. That's what's so exciting about these steps, is that it's at the end of it, you know, we're promised you know, a spiritual awakening as a result. And it's been my, my experience, and I, I, know, I know a lot of others, uh, that we're not limited to just one. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure all of you here are, are, uh, are of that same school because we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be in the book if it wasn't. Um, s- 
once we're once we've made a um, once we've at least become willing to believe that there's this power, then we get to a um, a decision, and that that's uh, step three. Are we? Um, My turn. You want to go? Yeah. I'll tee you up for it. Go yeah, for I it. Yeah, I was blooded. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. That was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Scott Lee, alcoholic. Hey, Scott. Hi, folks. Uh, a couple of things, real quick. Um, one is I have a central nervous system disorder. It causes my head to do this, and I don't even know it's happening. So it's going to look like I disagree with what I'm saying <laughs> or what he's saying. Now, I may be on him, <laughs> but on me, if I say it, I actually mean it. The, the Alamans have taught us to trust the actions instead of the words. We're going to suspend that for today in my case because that happens and I don't know what's happening, okay? Now, I may disagree with it later. I'm still learning. But if I say it today, I actually mean it. Um, the, the other thing is we've got an ask it basket here. Uh, we're hoping that y'all will put some questions in here. Really easy questions would be good. Um, and uh, I just want to pick up just a couple of pieces. I thought that was beautifully done. Um, one of my favorite quotations uh, from a non-AA source is from Hank Williams Sr., the great American philosopher. <coughs> who once said, there are a lot of good ideas in a pint, not so many in a quart. <laughs> that was my experience, and, but I don't know how to quit at a pint. And I used to get drunk when I was sure I wasn't gonna. Did you ever get drunk ex accidentally on a night when you're sure you weren't gonna? I used to get accidentally drunk. And uh, that doesn't happen to the earthlings. You know, they go out to have two drinks and they have two drinks. I don't understand it. Uh, it never happened to me that way. So um, page 12, uh, Matt referenced it earlier. For me, one of the most powerful concepts in here, I'm going to talk a lot about how I take somebody through the steps. I think there are a lot of really good ways to do this, and I'm not selling this one. This is just what I do. Ebby says, that Bill is drunk on gin pontificating about the czar of the heavens and universal mind, which, as you may recall, gin is perfect for that. And Ebby gets enough. Now, I don't know if this is how it happened. This is how I see it. And Ebby says, why don't you choose your own conception of God? Now, I don't know that was the energy. That's how I see it. And I love Matt's take on that. Ebby said something, a piece of the great golden truth that he didn't know. And I may talk about that a little bit later. The concept is so important, it's in italics. It's so important that on page 93 in the chapter, Working with Others, it says the same thing in only slightly different language a couple of lines down. He does not have to agree with your conception of God. He can choose any concept he likes, provided it makes sense to him. I think that takes the doorknob and the light bulb out of the equation, by the way, that makes sense thing. And so what I do with a new guy is I say, I want to ask you, and Matt touched it on page 46, that you're not going to understand God. My sponsor says, the teacup of my mind cannot contain the ocean of God. It can't be done. So when we say a God as you understand, we're not saying you're going to understand God. We're saying you don't have to believe what anybody else ever told you, and we don't care how qualified they claim to be. You don't have to buy it. That you and God can work that out together. But this is what I do. I say, I'm going to ask, so I got here terrified of God's will. See, very glad it's God's will. And if you're even thinking it, I can't work with that. I can't not possibly do steps two and three with that God. I can't do it. I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying I can't. So, so what I take my new guy, and I say, I want you to not disbelieve, but lay aside for a few moments what you believe about God, what you're trying to believe, and what they told you. And let's just do what's working for about three million of your closest friends. And I'm going to ask you to give me a series of single words and very short phrases to describe the individual characteristics you would like for God to have. I'm going to participate. If you like my suggestions, take them. If you don't like them, don't take them. Usually the first one they say is forgiving, and I tell them that wasn't good enough for me. And by the way, if you're having trouble with the God concept, you might want to start taking these down. They, they usually start with forgiving, and I tell them that wasn't good enough for me. I'm too guilty. I had had to have a God that was eager to forgive. I say, do you like that? Well, write it down. How about gentle, doesn't force me to his will? How about loving? How'd you like to have a God that loves you? 
write it down. How about creative? How'd you like to have a God that comes up with clever ways to get you out of the holes you keep digging in your life? How about available 100% of the time? How'd you like to have that? How about sense of humor? I want a God that laughs and dances. <laughs> you like that? Write it down. How about a God who wants what's best for you and knows what it is? Because clearly you don't. Because if you do, how'd you get into that chair? Tough question. <laughs> Tough question. How about a God whose will is the best deal there is? And if and only if I can have all of those, then powerful. But we can't start with powerful. Because many of us get here with a God I wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. And powerful is terrifying until you get eager to forgive, gentle, loving. Until you get all those in place, powerful is a bad deal. I save it for last. And this is what I say. I'm not going to ask you to believe this. You can't. Don't even try. I'm going to ask you to test drive it. I'm going to ask you to do what we call a, the scientists call it a working hypothesis. You probably know the term. It means we have reason to believe something may be true. We're not going to apply it in all cases and just see what happens. The reason we have to believe that might be true is that's my God. And you must make minds work and you wouldn't have asked me to sponsor you. So don't, don't believe it. Don't try to believe it. Test drive it. How do you think you would conduct your life if you believe that? And I hate that fake it thing. Uh-uh. I'm not going to ask you to fake anything. I want you to do something very honest. Search yourself. How do you think you would conduct your life if you believe this? Conduct your life that way for a little while and we'll just see what happens. Simple experiment. Our buddy Joe Krogan tells it this way. He says, his sponsor said to him, Joe, we're going to have to make it really simple for you, buddy. Step one, you're screwed. Joe says, wow, it's going to take a miracle. He said, that's step two. <laughs> step three is why don't you try for one? Joe says, I don't believe in God. And his sponsor says, you don't have to believe in God to be successful here, and you don't. But you must conduct your life like someone who does. It's the best description of spirituality I've ever heard. Conduct your life like someone who does, and we'll just see what happens. Can't be as bad as what brought you here. Can't be as bad. So it's a place where we can begin. And begin is good enough. Begin is good enough. Um, I've got way too many things I want to talk about. Page 13. Uh, those of you who are frequent readers of this book know that it's constantly rewritten. They added something on page 13 about six months ago. I swear it was not here. It was not here. I know for a fact it wasn't here. At the bottom, the, the steps first appear on page 13 in, in narrative form. But in the last paragraph, my friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator. New. I would have told you six months ago if you had asked me if I had a relationship with God before I came here, I would have said no, and it's not true. I did. It's called 911. See if you recognize some of these pre AA prayers. God, please help me pass this test I didn't study for. Please don't let her be pregnant. <laughs> I'm told I can be pregnant in the first person, ladies. Um, <clears throat> please don't let those flashing red and blue lights be for me. And my all-time favorite, when I'm in, in the bathroom about 2 o'clock in the morning, kneeling on the prayer rug, and we're down to the part of the proceedings where there's nothing coming out but noise and an occasional tear. You know where I am? You guys with me? And I would pray what I call the pre-AA prayer. We're going to do it together, all right? I'm going to do the first line. You do the second. Trust yourself. You know the prayer. Are you ready? God, get me out of this and... I'll never do it again. <laughs> which is alcoholic for amen, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> All right, if you're new here and you're not sure you need to be here, I've got a one-question test for you. <laughs> Did you know the prayer? Yes. Stick around. <laughs> the earthlings don't know the prayer. Okay? <laughs> so, so I look at the truth, and the truth is my way didn't work. The truth is, Scott, how does it work when you run full throttle after your own will? How's it working? And the answer is spin, crash, and burn. I, I'm doing things I don't want to do, going to places I don't want to go with people I don't want to be with. It, it just gets ugly and ugly, and I'm not going to do the detail. Uh, but page um, 62, my first sponsor said, selfishness, self centered thing we think is the root of our troubles, driven, driven, not mildly disconcerted on rare occasion, driven. A hundred forms of fear. Fear is a concern I may not get my will at some time in the future. 
self-delusion. I believe my own BS. I've only got two brain cells left. One of them creates BS. The other one buys it. Self-seeking. I'm wide after, open after my own will. I ain't thinking about you at all. Self-pity. Poor me, I didn't get what I wanted in the past. Poor me, I'm not getting what I want right now. Poor me, pour me a drink. And then go, my sponsor at that point said, how would you like some good news? I said, well, I, I'd like some good news. He said, I'd like to, how'd you like some really good news? I said, well, I'd really like some. How would you like the very best news you're going to get in your whole life? I said, I'm open. Hit me with it. <laughs> and he said, so our troubles we think are basically our own making. <laughs> was that it? That was it. I don't get it. He said, if it really is, the cops, the courts, the judges, the Russians, the Chinese, your future ex-wife, her mother, and their lawyer, if those people really are the problem, you lose. The good news is that you are the problem. And if you bring some willingness to this party, we can work on that. It did not seem like it at the moment. It's one of the two best pieces of news I've ever gotten in my life. Because the moment I become the problem, there's hope. If they've got to move a quarter of an inch, I'm cooked. The moment I become the problem, there's hope. The other piece of really good news on page 46, uh, I guess it's my favorite piece because they're two of the most powerful concepts. The one is that I'm not going to understand God. I talk a lot about the God of my, my experience. I don't understand God too much, but my experience has been really good. Five lines from the bottom. <clears throat> we found that God does not make two hard terms of those who seek him. Let me translate that into Tennessee English for you. God ain't mad at me. Man, that's some good news. That's not what I've been told. I, I told I'd already lost. Some awfully good news. Awfully good news. Um, and then it, it tells me twice, I'm back on page 62, it tells me twice I can't fix myself. I don't think I got time to do it. Let me flip back to page 60 for a second. We, he and I are going to be nuts up here trying to cover everything we want to cover in, in only a day. So just forgive us, my brain's rickish around inside my head like a golf ball hitting the bathroom right now. A, that we were alcoholic, could not manage our own lives. And I asked my newcomer, are you alcoholic? Convince me. Because he, he needs to tell me that. And I'm going to need that information later when he tries to settle for relief and I'm trying to get him all the way to recovery. <laughs> Can't manage your own life? I noticed you manage your way into AA. Did you manage your way into the back seat of a police car? Did you manage your way into a holding cell, a court of law? Did you manage to wreck a car? Did you manage to uh, work your way out of a relationship with a really good person? Did you manage to have a pretty good education presented to you that you didn't get much of? Did you, uh, did you manage to break your mother's heart? So we've, used, we've seen your management skills. You might want to give very serious consideration to firing yourself as general manager of your own life <laughs> based on your performance. And B, there's probably no human power can lead to who tried. Cops, courts, judges, the PTA, neighbors, parents, siblings, psychologists, psychiatrists, you who tried, none were successful. Does it make sense to you, given that piece of information, that none will be successful in the future? Are A and B true for you? If they are, we have not established the existence of God. We've established the need. If there isn't, if A and B are true, and there isn't a loving God, where are you going to get help? And all I'm proposing is you place a wager. Why don't you bet that there is? You can win that bet. Bet that there is. Let's see what happens. So that, what did I have to change? One of the things I had to change was I had to clean up my language. I was an Air Force pilot. I was proud of my profanity. I used to get out of the docks and repulse the stevedores just for practice. Mm -hmm. I had to clean up my language. I didn't say you had to, I said I had to. Because I don't think I can carry a spiritual message in a bucket of sewage. I can't do that. I had to learn to cry. I came to you unable, I had not cried in over 20 years when I came to you. There was a guy in my home group crying a couple of times a week and I finally said to him, tell me about the tears. He said, somebody says something beautiful and touches my heart and I weep and it feels so good. I said, I can't cry. He said, I'll teach you. No baby was ever born unable to cry. The inability to cry is learned. It can be unlearned. My emotions are how my spirit communicates with my mind and my body. And I cannot afford to block that channel. Because having my mind and body run the show put me in detox. Okay, so I can't pay that price again. Or at least I'd prefer not to. So I had to have an open channel. So uh, I had to learn to cry. And I've cried in front of some crowds a lot bigger than this one. And I'm okay with it. 
because that, that's part about becoming real. Um, another one thing that's so powerful here on page 61 is he's not a victim of the delusion. He can rest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well. Tennessee English, what that says is, I'm so insane, I think if I can get what I want, it'll make me happy. I have failed to notice the tens of thousands of times I got what I wanted was not rendered happy. Getting what I want will not make me happy. It never did. It never did. Getting what I want gives me a hunger for more, better, and different, but it never makes me happy. The path to happiness comes somewhere else. I hope we get to that later. But I want to cover on the bottom of page 62. This is the how and why, but first of all, we had to quit playing God. I had a guy named Bob Olson get one of his talks. I had him trapped in the hotel lobby for three hours one morning firing questions at him. And uh, I think he got tired. <clears throat> they said, let me ask you a question. I said, all right. St. Scott of Nashville is going to have a chance to, yes, Bob Olson, what's your question? <laughs> you know, a chance to impress him. <laughs> he said, so at the bottom of 62, you agreed to quit playing God. I said, yes. He said, how did you play God? I don't know. Well, I've added to his list. I don't know which of these are his and which are mine. Here are some of the ways I played God. I became angry when someone died. That's me saying I know who should die and how and when, and wow is that playing God. Try to manage my own life and the lives around me, and the closer you were to me, the harder I tried to manage your life. I judged people, and the evidence is I had resentments. Only way to get a resentment is to judge someone, find them guilty, be angry with them, and then feel that anger again. There's that feeling again of old anger. There's a resentment by definition, and it begins with judging. If you don't judge, you never get to that place. I trusted my motives. I believe for the longest time good motives are the best thing there is. Bottom of page 60. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Good motive is not the answer. This is deep and it's coming fast, and I apologize for that. Motive governs outcome irrespective of action. Motive says I can lie, cheat, steal, and make it come out the way I think it should. That's playing God. Principle governs action irrespective of outcome. We talk about turn it over to God. What do I turn over? The result. How do I do that? One, I stand today where he is, and two, I operate within his principles. That's why step 12 does not say and had good motives in all our affairs. It's because principle always trumps motive. Cliff Roach, you need to get some of his talks. The Cliffers said the 12 traditions are a set of principles designed to protect A from my very best motives. That's what our principles do is they protect us from our motives. Good motives is the most evil thing on planet Earth. And if, the, if the road to hell is paved with good intentions, the guardrails are made out of good motives. There was a guy in Germany in the 1930s and 40s whose motive was to purify the race. That was his motive, and he, and he killed millions <coughs> of people. His name was Adolf Hitler, and he believed he had a good motive. I'm told a newspaper man asked Al Capone one time, anyway, he's involved in all that illegal stuff. He said, I was just trying to get people the things they wanted. Capone had a good motive. There's a guy in Moscow, Russia today that believes he's got a good motive for starting a war and thousands of people getting killed. And I think good motive may be the most evil thing that's ever been to planet Earth. So I, it's not, I'm not against having good motive, but principle always trumps motive, always. I don't have time to tell my story of where I learned that. So at the bottom of page 62, where Bob said, how did you quit playing God? I became angry when someone died. I tried to manage my life, the lives around me. I judged. I trusted my motive. I needed to know. I asked the question, why? My sponsor said, why is a management question? And the first step says, you ain't in management. So all the questions begin with why have the very same answer. The answer is, you don't need to know. And I hated that when he said it. Today, I embraced this one of our cornerstones because I thought it was not knowing that made me crazy. Incorrect. It was needing to know that made me crazy. When I was able to lay down the need to know, I got peaceful. From a position of peace, I began to know. And the knowing isn't worth anywhere near as much as the peace. I erased the word why from my vocabulary. I do not ask why. I'm sober since 28 June 1984. I got the 39 year chip in my pocket. I have yet to hear a spiritual question begin with the word why. I haven't heard one yet. When I ask why, I am never looking for an answer. I'm looking for something I can argue with, manipulate, change, fight. I'm never looking for an answer. I had to get out of the why business. Um, Another way that I played God, Matt already touched on, I was sure everything I knew was correct. And anyone who disagreed with me was clearly a fool. Not only is that blocking, uh, 
am I playing God, but it blocks any chance I have to learn anything. Another one that I total lies. When I lie, I'm governing outcome. It's one of the ways I play God. So I had to get out of that business, and I can't. And that's why it said in the paragraph before that, neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. So this is a how and a why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. And they give us kind of a mediocre reason. It didn't work. <laughs> Do you know the first rule of cavalry? First rule of cavalry is when the horse is dead, dismount. You rode in here on a dead horse. Get off. <laughs> <laughs> It's similar to the first rule of holes. When you're in one, stop digging. Don't try to dig your way out of a hole. Right? <laughs> it's the wrong move. And then it, it talks about a decision. Step three, in my understanding, is not where I turn my will and life over to God or over to the care of God. It's where I decide to. The English verb to decide comes from the Latin verb scissere, which means to cut. A surgeon makes an incision. He cuts in. I make a decision. I cut away all the other options and act upon the one I have decided. And the difference between an intention and a decision, an intention is followed by more intentions. A decision is followed by action. That's the difference. That's the difference. Um, we've touched on a lot of stuff. Um, I think we're gonna go ahead and close this one and take a break. I'm on a liquid diet uh, because of some cancer I had in my throat. Um, I came to you on a liquid diet. It's not a big deal. It's just a different <laughs> liquid. And um, so I head to the men's room pretty often. If I get up and walk out while Matt's talking, it may not be because I'm offended by what he said. <laughs> <laughs> no telling. No problem. It may not. It may not. But uh, for those who are so inclined, uh, the third step prayer is on page 63. And I think it might be appropriate for us, for those who are so inclined, to uh, share that together. So let's take a few moments and think about what this thing means, and then we will slowly do the third step prayer. Prayer. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help, thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. We're going to take a 15-minute uh, and 30-second break. I learned to ask for what I want. Go away. <laughs>